Hello, and welcome to Nostalgic Medicine, where we take a look at fascinating stories about the history of medicine and healthcare. In today's video, we're going to have a look at the history of acupuncture. Acupuncture is indeed the most popular form of alternative or complementary medicine in the Western world, with surveys from countries like America showing that at least 1% of people receive acupuncture every year, and 5% of Americans say that they've received acupuncture at some time during their life. In fact, what might surprise you is that even some professional medical societies recommend using acupuncture to treat specific diseases, as you'll find out later in this video. So being a doctor that regularly comes across patients who use acupuncture, I recently became quite curious as to how and why acupuncture has become so widespread, despite the proven benefits of conventional medicine. And to do this, I firstly needed to learn about its history, and I secondly had to look a bit deeper into exactly what acupuncture is, and whether it does truly work or not. And I want to share with you what I've learned, in a nuanced and as unbiased as possible way, so in this video, we're first going to look at what acupuncture is, then how it originated and spread across the world, and then I'll finally attempt to review whether there is indeed any scientific evidence that acupuncture can treat diseases. So as a doctor, my knowledge of acupuncture before making this video was no better than the average member of the general public as you shouldn't be surprised to hear that this was not covered in medical school. So that meant that the very first thing that I needed to do was to learn about how acupuncture works, and what I found out was that it had some similarities to humorism, which I am familiar with. Essentially, acupuncture is based on the beliefs of traditional Chinese medicine. Traditional Chinese medicine is a very complex field, but to simplify it for you, one of its main beliefs is that the primary internal organs of your body like your liver, brain and heart contain a vital energy known as qi which keeps you alive. And this qi flows to the more superficial organs of the body like the skin, bone and muscles via paths known as channels or meridians. Disease or illness happens when there's an imbalance of your vital energy or qi, which I think you'll agree sounds very similar to the ancient Greek theory of humorism. But in acupuncture, instead of bloodletting, the treatment involves placing needles into specific acupuncture points in the skin, which is said to alter the flow of qi. There's over 2,000 acupuncture points as you can see from this acupuncture statue, and the points that the needles are placed on depends on things like where in the body the illness is, as well as things that don't necessarily make sense to an outside observer, like the colour of the tongue, the sound of your voice, or the strength of your pulse. And the list of things that acupuncture has been claimed to treat are endless, which include things like back pain, headaches, depression, cancer, stroke, epilepsy, bowel issues, and so on. So that's the basics of how acupuncture works. So when and where did this start? Well if you've been paying attention, I think I've already given away that it originated in China. But here's the thing, no one is 100% certain how old the practice is. And this is because archaeologists have found ancient surgical tools and markings on human remains from up to 5,000 years ago, which some say could have been a primitive form of acupuncture, whereas others say that they were due to an unrelated medical procedure. But what we do know for certain is that the first ever undisputed written description of acupuncture occurred around the year 100 BC and this was in a medical textbook known as the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine. This book contained what was at the time the most comprehensive description of many branches of traditional Chinese medicine which had been specifically endorsed by the emperor's own doctors. You can think of the Yellow Emperor's classic as laying the groundwork for acupuncture, 
by introducing concepts such as chi, and this would gradually be expanded on over the next few thousand years, as acupuncture divided into many different schools of thoughts and practice, and would eventually become a mainstay of Chinese medicine, alongside other fields such as herbal medicine, moxibition, and copping. As the field of acupuncture was expanding, it also spread outside of China. It first spread to Korea around 500 AD and then gradually to other neighbouring countries over the next few hundred years. But something that did surprise me to learn was that it wasn't until around the 16th century that we see the first Western accounts of acupuncture, despite the fact that we know that there was extensive contact and trade between China and Europe ever since Roman times. But unfortunately for acupuncture's potential development in the West, the 16th century was also around the time that the modern scientific method started to find its way into Western medicine, and the lack of science to acupuncture meant that it only became a niche treatment in places like Britain and America, and the only Western country that acupuncture seemed to have taken off was in France, after a Catholic missionary who went to China introduced them to it. And to add to this, once modernised Western medicine started to be introduced into China, the popularity of acupuncture actually declined there, as people began to look at it as being superstitious and irrational. It was even banned in China in 1929, but then when General Mao Zedong took over the country in 1949 and made China communist, he decided to once again legalise and recommend acupuncture. This was mainly done as a patriotic move, but also as a way for even the poorest members of the population to have access to some form of basic healthcare. So acupuncture had a bit of a renaissance in China from the 1950s, where it once again became a widely accepted practice, and even some of the most prestigious hospitals performed acupuncture, with some Chinese doctors trying to evaluate it according to the scientific method as I'll show you later in the video. And this time round, acupuncture was able to gain a large western following when westerners came across the practice. The event that I was able to trace as being the catalyst for the western spread occurred in 1971, when an American journalist called James Reston had to have his appendix removed while in Beijing. And instead of receiving standard pain medication after the surgery, he was given acupuncture to relieve his pain. Reston wrote about this experience in the New York Times newspaper, where he was the chief editor, and this sparks the nation's curiosity about acupuncture, causing other media outlets to talk about this. And this in turn will cause members of the general Western public to try out this unorthodox oriental treatment for themselves, to see whether it will help with their various health issues. And this is basically where we are at today. It's a moderately popular treatment all around the world. And even many highly regarded medical organisations have started to recommend acupuncture as a complementary treatment, which can be used in addition to standard medical treatments for certain conditions as you can see here. But I'm not the type of doctor who just follows guidelines blindly without questioning it. So in light of these recommendations, what I wanted to find out was, is there any scientific evidence for acupuncture's benefit? This is what we're going to have a brief look at in the final part of this video. It surprised me to learn that there has been an extensive body of scientific research that has been published about acupuncture. The first thing I want to get out of the way is that obviously, the whole concept of chi and channels aren't true. These were ideas that came about in a time when people had very little idea about human anatomy. However, there are many things that we do in medicine which we don't know exactly how they work, just that they do work. 
Electroconvulsive therapy or drugs like paracetamol and quinine are perfect examples of this. So if acupuncture does have a proven benefit, then it definitely should be considered. The best place in my opinion for you to look at if you want to check whether any medical intervention has good evidence supporting it or not are Cochrane reviews. If you haven't heard about Cochrane, they are a UK based charity which are dedicated to producing the highest quality evidence based recommendations in medicine and they do this by looking through all the research that has ever been produced on a topic. As for acupuncture, they have produced over 20 reviews on it for its various supposed indications and these are the general conclusions that I got from these reviews. Acupuncture is generally safe. Rare complications include infection and puncturing the lung but these are becoming increasingly uncommon because acupuncturists should be trained on how to minimise these effects. Acupuncture will not reverse or cure any major disease process. For example, it won't fix your osteoarthritis, it's not going to cure your epilepsy, it won't stop the long-term inflammatory process that causes heart attacks or strokes, and it won't stop the progression of your cancer. So anyone who tries to sell it as a cure-all is simply lying. However, when it comes to symptoms of a subjective nature like pain, headache and depression, acupuncture might improve these symptoms in the short term when compared to giving no treatment at all. But this does seem to be mostly due to the placebo effect, because there have been studies which have been done where the needles were placed on parts of the skin that were not the traditional acupuncture points, and these generally found the exact same effect on symptoms as if they were placed on these points. So what I have been able to conclude is that the act of sticking needles on the skin does something to the brain, which for some people might result into a meaningful clinical effect. And you've probably noticed my constant use of the word might, and that's because simply the evidence on acupuncture is quite weak and contradictory at times. The literature is riddled with problems like publication bias due to many of these studies coming from China where researchers are known to hide negative results. Other major problems include the inadequate use of placebo, randomization or blinding, which is the minimum needed for high quality studies. So basically, we definitely need better quality trials if acupuncture wants to be accepted into mainstream medicine. But here's one final thing to consider. Many of the illnesses with subjective symptoms like pain, depression and insomnia are often treated quite poorly with conventional medicine in my honest opinion. In fact, we sometimes make the patient worse off than before as we get them addicted to drugs like opioids or benzos and we even give them systemic side effects with minimal long-term benefit. So if acupuncture can stop a person from going through that, some medical societies have recommended that a patient with these issues can consider trying acupuncture out, as even if it is just placebo, there isn't much harm to it. But I myself was taught as a doctor to be an independent thinker, who only goes on good evidence, so even though I won't push back on a patient doing acupuncture, I personally won't be explicitly recommended acupuncture Partially because I'm not that comfortable with people making money and giving people hope of something that hasn't been proven to work. So unless acupuncture does reveal itself to have some true benefits, it will firmly remain under the ever-expanding umbrella of alternative medicine. As the common question goes, what do you call alternative medicine that has been proven to work? Medicine. <laughs>